Let's go ahead and stand up. I will worship and praise you with all of my strength. I will seek you. You're the God of the city. 
same God who never fails when I fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. Working all things out. Oh, yes, I will bless your name. And all 
Thank you for his goodness. Let's just lift him up. Father God, we just thank you for your goodness. Oh, we thank you that your goodness runs after us. Oh, hallelujah. No one's there with us every step of the way. And we just praise you. We worship you. We thank you for your goodness that chases after us, that pursues us. Even when we were running away from it, you pursued us because you so greatly loved us. Oh, Father God, we just worship you and we thank you for your goodness. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. 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 Glory to God. I don't know about you, but I am thankful for the goodness of God. Amen. I am thankful for all the times he's been there. Amen. Hallelujah. He's been there through. Hallelujah. You can go ahead and be seated. <laughs> Amen. All right. So welcome to Sunday morning service. And Cap's going to come up in a minute, but he's making sure, you know, everything levels are right and all that stuff. All right. So we'll go ahead and take up the offering and then Cap and I are going to do something we've never done before, so yay. <laughs> um, we're going to do like a tag team thing. That's kind of new. I mean, we've done it like with youth, but it's a little bit different, you know. Um, but this will be a new experience for the both of us. <laughs> so praise the Lord. Um, but we'll go ahead and take up the offering. So um, if you know your, you know, the digital giving methods or if you're giving the traditional way, so we are still PayPal. We are in the process of changing that. So that will be changed soon, hopefully very soon. Um, but if you need an offering envelope, you can raise your hand. All right. So um, let's go ahead and pray over the offering. All right. Father God, we thank you for the offering. 
and to help the work go out that needs to go out both here and abroad. And we're just so thankful for the opportunity that we have to sow into the kingdom and to give of our fruits. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. (laughs) All right. So go ahead and. There we go. <laughs> All right. So we're um, going to be sharing the word. We're going to be sharing um, what happened in Turkey. <laughs> um, so just a heads up to um, what we're talking about here while we're online will obviously in a lot of ways be very generic. Generic. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of things that we can't share and put out there. Um, so we are going to end the stream um, before we actually end, and then there's some things that we want to talk about. When we do end it, we're not actually ending it. <laughs> so <laughs> stick around for a minute. we got a couple other things we do want to talk about. So just to give you a heads up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, so um, of course, you know, we had the opportunity to go to Turkey, um, total like amazing experience. Yeah. Um, you know, in January of this year, the opportunity was presented through a team that I was that I work on for Rama, um, and I just couldn't get away from it. I was like, I'm supposed to go, and you know, I told him, I said, I know you may not be able to go with work or whatever, but I'm. And um, as time went on, he's like. No, I'm going to figure out a way to go. Like, I want to go too, mm-hmm. you know. And so it just worked out. Of course, that's like, well, that's double the cost. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're thinking, oh, that, that is double the cost. And just a little background, you know, there have been so many times, like, I've tried to go on missions trips and, you know, nothing would come in. <laughs> I'd put it out there. I'd pump it out there, you know. And $35, you know, would maybe come in. (laughs) It's like, well, praise God, that'll get me a meal, (laughs) you know. (laughs) But that won't get me there. Um, And so there was a little bit of, I guess you could say fear, anxiety about putting it out there. We sent letters out to people that, you know, we, we had known and friends and that kind of thing, kind of behind the scenes. But putting it on the internet, it was like, I don't want to put another thing out there and then it not work out. And I was in the car with my dad, with Pastor, and um, he's like, why not put it on there and put it out there? And it was just like, bam, 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 bam. Like everything came in but $1,000. And then I put a thing out there that we were $1,000 away from our goal and within, what, like 48 hours, we were in a restaurant in downtown Greensboro, and Pastor and Miss Janie called, and they're like, are you sitting down? And we're like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, the last $1,000 just came in from an anonymous donor, and we just cried there in the restaurant. And so it was just like, it was God's handprints all over it. And then, of course, getting there, it was a total new cultural experience. Like, I've grown up traveling in Europe and even, you know, across the border into Mexico and Canada and the Bahamas. This was a new experience in many wonderful ways. It was also in some, like, growing ways. You're also dumped into a country where you do not speak the language at all. Merhaba and donor, which is food. (laughs) You know, that's a really good sandwich. (laughs) But that was it. So um, definitely a very cool experience. Do you want to add to that? Yeah. um, Because as you guys know, like my first trip even overseas, like that was not Cuba related to the military, was Paris and spring break. And so like I got kind of thrown into the deep end of this whole travel thing. And so... (laughs) Uh, but again, like she said, it was very different being in a place where um, there's some French words that look like English words, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so you can kind of, you know, figure it out. And so, you know, we're figuring it out as we go, like, okay, what's exit? What's, inter- you know, like just those yeah. small little things to figure out, you know, where we're going and all that. But it was, it was definitely a, 
a learning and a growing experience for sure. Yeah. So, um, and I would say the biggest cultural whatever is everywhere I've ever traveled, even if there is a, what we would call a, a dead church, there's steeples everywhere. You know, there's churches everywhere. Even if they aren't a live, active church, they're still church buildings. <laughs> and this was very different because yeah. instead of steeples, there were minarets everywhere and the call to prayer. And so that was a cultural experience and a very different experience being there in the land of the early church, but it's a different religion now. Yeah. And so we'll get in more into that. Yeah, 4 a.m. calls to prayer are, are very loud. <laughs> you don't need, yeah, you do not need an alarm clock over there. The call to prayer wakes you up at yeah. 4 a.m., 5 a.m., depending on the day. Yeah, so, so <clears throat> all right, so we'll go ahead and get started with the slideshow to go along with our message and about what we did along with some observations we made just about the word and about, you know, our jobs as, as believers and stuff mm -hmm. like that, kind of intertwined, if that makes sense. So. Yeah. And I will just, like, add in as a preface, you know, we hear over and over again, we heard it at Rama. we've heard it since then, preparation time is never wasted time. Yep. This trip unveiled that in a way I'd never seen before. Yep. So, Yeah. <laughs> yes, definitely. All right, so. Go ahead, go yep. next slide. So we wanted to show you this graphic um, just to kind of get into some of the things we were going to share about. But this right here, this is from the Joshua Project. If you are interested in missions and that kind of stuff, this is an amazing website. They do a lot of data research um, on the progress of the gospel in the world among people groups. I first heard about this 10 years ago in January, 10 years ago, um, Matt B, um, he was like a guest, he was in town for a little while and he was a guest speaker in one of my classes and um, he was like just this, and Shannon was in there too, but he was just fired up about, you know, the Great Commission and Rama's role in this and all of this stuff and he even showed some of these maps that are older that show when Rama graduated, it's first completely like red and yellow. And it showed the progress of as Rama grads graduated and went into these parts of the world, how it shifted the trajectory of those people groups and shifted them from unreached, which is red. That means they have no, um, they do not have the gospel in their language. They do not have a church in their area, any of those things. They've never heard the name of Jesus. So that is what is an unreached people group. But as they went into South America and those places, it changed and shifted that. And so he was just sharing, like, I was like, man, this guy really believes what he's talking about <laughs> with, you know, like the Great Commission, you know, we've got to go into these places and this is the place where the need is the greatest. So you can see what we've always heard about, the 1040 window, it is still the area that is kind of see it a little bit better here <clears throat> this shows you you can see red is unreached least reached so those are people who do not have access to the gospel um and then green that's like places where there's established churches there's established missions work there's established um there's bibles in those people's languages um all of that kind of stuff but that red section that is the area of greatest need um so we'll, s we'll jump ahead, and you can kind of see the name of, well, it's a little small, but the name of the countries in there, um, including the one that we were at. And then we'll move ahead to 1040 window by this area is important. Um, for every 1 million people, there's one church. Can you imagine <laughs> in the United States where we have churches everywhere, on every corner, churches pop up constantly, you know, and in this region, there is one church for costumes for their pets than was sent to missions and ministry work in this region. The region with the greatest need for the gospel, Americans spent more on costumes for their pets for Halloween than was sent to this region. 
Less than 1% of all giving towards missions and outreach goes to the 1040 window. That's $10 every $1,000. So when we're talking about missions funds and, and money going to missions, 1% of those that money leaving the United States is going to the middle uh, to the 1040 window. So Middle East, North Africa, China, mm -hmm. all that. Yeah. Ten dollars for every thousand. So ninety percent of the people in this region are unreached. This three point five billion people just in this population. region alone that are unreached. With a population of just over seven billion right now in the world, half of half of the world's population is unreached and it's all in this area right here. That dark green, that's like people that they're reached. They're significantly reached. They are going to church. They, you know, they are a professing Christian. Um, so what does unreached mean when we use these terms? Because we use it a lot for this region. Um, so unreached or least reached people is a people group where there is no indigenous community of believing Christians with adequate numbers of and resources to evangelize this people group without outside assistance. So um, typically the way Joshua Project or less than 2% evangelical. So that's kind of how they come up with those numbers. All right. Um, and so with that, as we look at um, the progress of, you know, spreading the gospel, what would be the greatest need? Having the gospel, having the Bible in people's languages. And so um, currently there are about 1,860 languages that have no scripture at all translated in their language. So do not have any scripture in their primary language. So, and then you can see a little bit about China, but um, there. So let's go into... Mr. History teacher here. He's just going to share. I, I was like, this has to be brief. Because <laughs> <Right. laughs> he was like talking about the Mongols. And I was like, this needs to be brief. <laughs> <laughs> you go to the next one. That's great. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, yeah. So uh, just a kind of a quick history of the area. Um, so in the, the class that I teach, um, AP World History, is um, this area, this group is um, – or, sorry, the Ottoman Empire. It's named more times in the curriculum than any other, um, like, empire or anything else like that. So it's very important as far as, like, world history goes. Um, but if you look at the over history, um, so starting, and this is not even going into, like, prehistory and all that stuff, but kind of <laughs> more modern. Um, the Greeks were some of the first to go through there, like Alexander the Great and all that. Um, and then... The Roman occupation, say again. I was going to say, Troy's there. We got yeah. to see, like, some Troy artifacts, like the Trojan horse. Yeah, that, all that you stuff. Know. Yeah, it's really, yeah. I mean, it really is, like, when, you, when we think about, like, the just world history and human history, like, that area has been so important, and, and it's just, it's, yeah, it's yeah. incredible. And, like I said, me being the history guy, like, it was just, yeah, uh, it just, yeah, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, so, after, you know, the Greeks, uh, the Greek Empire mm -hmm. fell, you had the Romans come up. Um, and, of course, the Roman Empire, you know, it spread throughout Europe and a lot of North Africa, Middle East. Um, eventually, they split, you know, toward the end, um, and then it became the Byzantine Empire. So the Byzantine Empire is the Roman Empire, but it's like the eastern part of it. Um, and so the Byzantine Empire is where Istanbul really, really gets established as like a very large um, city. And um, so then, you know, after... You know, the year about 600, 630 is when we see Islam start to come in. Never really took over, like, Istanbul and, like, the large area of Turkey, but they did take over, like, interior of Turkey and stuff like that at some points. Um, then you have a group called the Seljuk Turks, and the word Turk, what is that? What do you guys think that means? <laughs> Turkey, Turkey, right? <laughs> <laughs> so the Seljuk Turks were, a, like, a nomadic group. Um, and they were in Central Asia, and they were one of the first groups to convert to Islam through the Islamic conquest in, you know, like the seven to eight hundreds, right around there. Um, and so eventually the Seljuk Turks are going to be the ones that kind of come in and, and take over. Um, so the Seljuk Turks take over for a while, and then come the Mongols. And I don't know if you guys know anything about the Mongols, but they are my favorite empire in all of world history. 
Um, and I don't know why, they're just like fun to study because they were, they were here for about 100 years and then now they're gone. Like there's really no trace of them. <laughs> like it's crazy. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> so during the Mongol occupation, they basically rounded up all the Turks and they put them into one area of Turkey. And they said, you know, stay here, basically, don't bother us. And that's when they organized and got together, and a group called the Ottomans came out of that. Uh, so it was a clan within the Seljuk Turk group. And so the Ottomans came, and then that's when they took over and basically started taking over all of Anatolia or Turkey. Um, so they start taking over uh, Turkey, and then in uh, 1053 is whenever they actually come in, and they're finally, they have a, the siege of Constantinople, um, where they, you know, try to take over Constantinople for a long time, and they finally succeed. And so that's when Turkey falls and becomes a Muslim country. So about 1453 is when we pinpoint that. Two, if you know your Bible, Acts 2, and the Holy Spirit falls, and um, people hear them in their own language. There were people from Cappadocia that were there. Um, some of these other names are also parts of um, what is modern-day Turkey. But Cappadocia, they get saved in that first round of evangelism and go back and there's churches established in Turkey out of that. Um, so and also, as you see in Acts 2, you got like Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> that's all throughout Turkey. Um, and so that's like... Like Phrygia, Pamphylia, that's like the northeastern, eastern, southern part of Turkey. And so when, when, when they came, when the, okay, so when the 150 got filled with the Holy Ghost in the upper room, you know, they came down speaking in other tongues, right? And, you know, Peter came out, you know, gave a sermon, and then was it 3,000 people were saved right there, right? And then they talk about, like, and this is where it talks about, like, they're speaking in our language. These tongues are in our language, but they're from Galilee. How do they know our languages? So like Cappadocian and Poncha, all this stuff. And so they hear this message, and they get saved. And then they go back to their, you know, their place of origin, and they start telling other people about it. And so we start having churches, like, bam, right there from the beginning, Acts 2. Churches are being established in this area. Yeah. So, um, of course, as he was touching on with history, this is an area of major, like, always been a very important place um, biblically and just culturally. Um, So real quick, the seven churches of Revelation are in Turkey. So um, this area. Um, The Isle of Patmos is like right off the coast of Turkey. So um, that's where John was, you know, exiled and yeah. wrote Revelation. And so the book of Revelation came, the seven churches of Revelation. You see them all there, those little red dots. And then Cappadocia, which is the region that we were in, is more in that central Turkey area. All right, so moving into Cappadocia, because we wanted to give a little bit of that backstory, um, because in this area, we had the opportunity outside of, you know, ministry um, opportunities and so forth. We got to do a little bit of sightseeing. And this area, we got to go into um, these churches that you see here, these caves. And these caves served as a refuge for the early church when they were hiding from the Romans and stuff like that were going on in the beginning of Islam. Um, they hid out in these caves and they had churches and stuff in there. Um, and so it was just really cool to see some of these early Christian symbols and, you know, so forth and um, painting and think about people from the early church, the beginning of the church, walked in these footsteps. Just very, very cool. And so I think it just goes to show that, like, um, you know, we talk, you know, in, in, in the Bible and in Christianity all the time about seed, right? You know, you plant seeds, you water seeds, and what happens? They grow, right? Mm-hmm. Well, there are still haven't been watered in a very, very long time. Yeah. They've been kind of trampled over. They've been pushed further down. But the seeds are there. It's just a matter of how do we get it to grow, right? The right environment. Mm-hmm. I think back to, like, um, I know that in ancient, in Egypt, when they were, like, going into some of the, um, the tomb, you know, tombs and stuff there, they found seeds of plants that had been extinct for thousands of years, and in the right environment, 
what happened? They grew and they sprang forth. And I just can't help but see, you know, those natural examples, they apply to, you know, to spiritual things. And their seed, the ground is hard, but there is some amazing seed that has been sown and foundations that have been laid in in this region and in this country that are just waiting for the right, you know, the right water, the right sunlight, the right, you know, opportunity to spring forth and to flourish. <clears throat> At Istanbul uh, a few days early uh, because the flights were like a <laughs> half the it's, price. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we wound up staying at Istanbul, which was great again because we got to see all the history and we got to see, you know, the uh, the evolution of you know everything going on there. Um, and Constantinople was renamed that many many years ago by the Emperor Constantine. And so the Emperor Constantine, um, uh, Roman, yeah, right? yeah, Roman. Mm-hmm. Sorry, I don't know my ancient history as well as I need. I am like an ancient <laughs> history nerd. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Constantine, he um, he had a vision um, at one point in his life where, um, like, God spoke to him and said, you know, by this symbol, you will be successful pretty much and conquer. And it was like the Cairo symbol. Like, anyway, it was it was Christ. So he it's switched. Like the, the P and the X, if yeah. you know, like, liturgical, you know. Um, and so... After that, he basically converted the entire um, first churches that were built, that was built in um, Istanbul, or sorry, Constantinople at the time, um, and it's still standing today. It's the only, um, the only church there that was not converted. So when the Ottomans came through after 1453, all these churches, these Orthodox churches that were there before, they basically plastered over them, and they made them in the mosques, except for this one because they were using it as a munitions, <laughs> um, like storage. Yeah. The only thing that they did was on the outside, the spire, uh, they changed the cross to a crescent. But you can see on the inside there, it's like the, uh, the, the cross is still, or the mosaic cross is still there. Um, and it's, it's amazing that it wasn't destroyed, but this is one of the... And Constantine actually commissioned this. Yeah. So that was really cool. That like It was commissioned by Constantine, mm-hmm. and it was built there. It was finished in 337 A.D. Yeah. And we got to walk in, and it was just really cool. It reminded me of walking into, like, the prison where they believe Paul and Peter were held in Rome. You smell the wet stone and the dirt when you walk in. It's just so old, you know, that kind of a smell. That's how it was. It was like walking back in time. It was just very, very cool to experience that. All right. And this is the Hagia Sophia, or some of us call it the Hagia Sophia, um, so it was originally built in 357, um, so it's a little bit newer than the Hagia Irene. Um, but then there was like some earthquakes, fire and stuff, and so the last, you know, um, building was 537. So, um, of course, you have to cover your head to go in there now because it has been converted into a mosque. Um, but... What I love is this door that we're under, and you see the door right there. Supposedly, of course, if you know, like, church history and stuff, um, the Ark landed in what's modern-day Turkey, Noah's Ark. Supposedly, um, wood from Noah's Ark was... ...that's still there as it is being used as a mosque, and there's like a little symbol. We'll see a closer view of it on the next slide, but we won't get there just yet. But there's a little symbol over that door. And it is um, basically saying, you know, I'm the shepherd and, you know, all who come to me, you know, I, I am the, and then it has something else about, you know, I am the door. And so it's just, I don't know, it's very moving. You're standing there in a building where people are worshiping through one religion, and there's the truth right there, you know, and every time they walk through, this is right there um, with the king bowing down to him. But this was very cool because this is, like, when we talked about going to Istanbul, like, this is, like, the place that we really wanted to make sure we went to Um, because historically it's just a very, very important, um, architecturally it's a marvel, um, just all the it it's changed the history of architecture. Yeah. It's it's something you you should see. 
Um, and I talk about it a lot in my class. So yeah. It was great. <laughs> so we'll look at the next slide. So but if you look um, kind of where that column is, if you look at that ceiling, you're going to see a top, top left picture. You're going to see a cross up there. So the cool thing is, well, it's not cool, but this is the cool thing that I'm getting to. <laughs> but um, when these were converted in, when this was converted into a mosque, they plastered over all of the Christian iconography and um, tried to erase the church history from it. But they can't explain why. The cross has bled through the plaster and is coming through. <laughs> And here we are, you know, standing there, and we're looking there. We're just, like, sobbing and, um, you know, just having this kind of surreal experience that here Muslims are coming in. They're worshiping, you know, Allah, but Jesus is making himself known, you know, right there <laughs> beside their prayer sections. Jesus is making himself known, you know, so it may be illegal to preach and evangelize but jesus is making himself known amen, amen. <laughs> hallelujah so anyway we were i mean i'm still crying about that but we were really crying we're just standing there like, oh my gosh <laughs> you know so yeah. and then you know in the when, when the ottoman empire fell in the 1920s and became the republic of turkey um it was no longer used as a mosque um it was a uh, museum or like a heritage site type thing. Mm -hmm. And so for, you know, decades, people have been, you know, going in there and all that stuff. But in the past two years, the president of Turkey has um, turned it back into a mosque. So they reconverted it back into a mosque. And so now they've limited where you can go and what you can see yeah. and all that stuff. But So, yeah. So a few years ago, it was like it was a museum. Mm -hmm. And now it's a mosque again. All right, so more into the ministry part of this trip. So this was just like the history, kind of to get you familiar with all that. Um, but you're good. You're good. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> Come on, Doctor Belt. No. <laughs> all right. So you've heard. Um, pastor talk about like you know working with Rama and stuff that I've been doing so I work in the blue region that you see there on the world map that is what we call um, Rama Eme it's Europe Africa Middle East blue section which is the one you see here in the green and pink um, that is the Middle East, North Africa. And they've created that sub-region because they know this is the area of the greatest need of the gospel. Currently, there is only one nation that has a school in that area, but they also have a publishing house. And they are publishing um, all of Dad Hagen's books and Faith Library books into other Arabic-speaking nations in this region. But the Coptic... Um, seminaries have just adopted some of dad hagen's books that okay <laughs> in um you know in that nation of the pharaohs <laughs> um are using that to teach their ministers that they're training up in their denomination so very cool things that are happening. We also have the Farsi Book Project, which started before Afghanistan fell. You know, um, if you know about Farsi, that's spoken predominantly in that region in motion before that fall happened. So, um, yeah. so this is why we were there. I've been working with these two regions, and then in January, this opportunity opened up. And we'll move on to the next slide. So this is you on the map uh, before. So it's kind of that um, central east-ish area um, of Turkey. So Cappadocia is not a city, it's a region. Um, and so it's kind of a central location for, you know, this this uh, to be put on. Yeah. And um, near there you have um, all of Tarsus. Mm -hmm. Um, that's close by. You have the capital of Turkey close by. 
And then, of course, this whole region where there's cave cities, underground cities. We went into an underground city that was created by the Hittites. Do you remember you the Hittites? The B.C., and it was used as a refuge for Christians in the early church yeah. and through the 1900s. Yeah. So. Um, so, yeah, so um, within... Um, the conference, obviously, um, there, there's a part of this. Um, it had been going on for about 20... Next year will be the 30th That's anniversary right. of this specific conference, but this is the first year it was a partnership with RAMA. And so, um, essentially, you know, the it, it's a conference for, you know, believers in the area to be... We would have, like, a winter Bible or a camp meeting or something like that. This is kind of like their their yeah. thing. Um, but kind of the other half of it was Rama coming in and working to set the, the foundations for bringing Bible schools in. We were lucky enough to be um, in a meeting uh, with local pastors. And when I was talking about local, I mean like from all around uh, Turkey. Yeah. And um, you know, Matt Beamer and all them, they were kind of explaining, you know, what is Rama, uh, what do we do, you know, what are we trying to do, this kind of thing. And then we got to hear from the pastors um, about what's going on, you know, in that region and their needs and that kind of thing. Um, so okay, the population is about 88 million. Um, about 8,000 8, are Christian. Yeah. So, I mean, put that in perspective, right? And about 10% of those 8,000, so about 800 to 1,000 ish, are spirit filled. The other ones are more of your traditional liturgical type churches, you know? So, um, there's a need <laughs> um, to, you know, to, to bring the gospel to, to water those seeds that we talked about before because they're there. It's just a matter of getting the people there to, to do the work. And, um, Kutsal Ru, that's Holy Spirit in Turkish. They, two days before the conference, had just gotten these boxes of books in. It had just been translated into Turkish. It's Dad Hagen's um, Holy Spirit study workbook. And it had just been translated, and they gave it away to each family for free while we were there to get it into their hands. I know. <laughs> to hunger, but there's such a lack of teaching. Yeah. And, um, you know, and that's why we and some of the others were there was to help be a supply to do anything from ushering and greeting to ministering to, you know, catching people, you know, whatever we needed to do so that those that never get the opportunity. So there's just, there's more things going on in that region, and it's like you want to share them all, but there's no way we could share everything that we heard. So we're just hitting the highlights. Yeah. <laughs> and so as, as we're talking to these pastors, um, they're older. Um, all the pastors that were in there were older. Um, they've been... Uh, years, 50 mm -hmm. years, and... Um, with, with, with their experiences, you know, they talked about how, um, you know, today in Turkey is much different than it was, 40 you know, years 40, ago. 50 years ago. Um, so, you know, back then, if, you know, if they walked down the street with a Bible, they would be arrested, you know, that kind of thing. Now, here's the, the, so the crazy thing is, is that in Turkey's constitution, they actually have freedom of religion. Like, it's written in their constitution, you know, it's very much modeled after ours in a lot of ways, you know, freedom of religion is there freedom of speech, but even though it's there, it's still being persecuted, if that makes sense. They had no basis to charge them with anything, right? But they've talked about how over time that's, you know, gotten less and less, so now it's, you know, they can walk around with their Bibles, or they can have a, um, a table and talk to people in the, in the parks and stuff like that. So things are getting better politically in a lot of ways, 
Um, but what they said was, for 40, 50, 30, 40, 50 years, we're oh. tired, you know? They have nobody there really to help them, to build them up. And one of the pastors even talked about, we need um, an Aaron and a, a, her. a her, right? Yeah. To hold our arms up, to yeah. help us out. You know, we talk about the Old Testament, you know, with Moses and, mm -hmm. and the battle. As long as his arms were up, they were to, to lift them up and to help them. Um, but they don't have that. They don't have this younger generation coming and, and, and being that support and being there to take it over when they're gone. That's and sweet. so that's where um, Rama came in and, and Matt Beamer's talking about, you know, like this is what we want to do. We want to your work continues. Yeah. Right? So that's what Rama's all about is training the laborers mm -hmm. that are going to work in the church and all the different whatevers and to make sure they have a good foundation of the word, mm -hmm. you know, and stuff. So, but, and that's the thing too, is like, you know, like sometimes we can get want the whatever, but that's not Ramah's heart. That's not pastor Hagen's heart. He, pastor Hagen's heart is we get in there and we teach these people to build their local church. Mm -hmm. It's not our name on it. It's not us, you know, promoting ourselves because eventually we want to pass it on to them mm -hmm. and then we go somewhere else. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's the heart of Rama is to make sure it's the locals. It's the, it's the native the people. The indigenous. To last past a generation, what they've learned is you need to train the indigenous people with the truth. Because, you know, if you have expats coming, eventually they'll retire or they'll pass away, you know. And if they haven't trained anyone up under them, there's no one to carry it on. So instead of just filling a bunch of Americans in there, there's people who can then take it further, mm -hmm. which is what's happened in um, Nigeria. The Beamers went in there. They started Rama Nigeria, raised up like Nigerians to take over and it has just exploded in growth um, Tokes is one of the main guys like it's just taken off and so that's what they see happening in this region yeah. and that's their heart and their dream for this our way of doing things here in America is way different than their way of doing things over there like you know we, we're just it's totally different cultures and so you got to have people who know that and who relate to it and can work within that culture to bring these changes and to bring this and all. Yeah. Um, but really, so the, the big thing that we noticed, as we said, was um, so a lot of people, you know, they came to Jesus in this region, not just in Turkey, but other areas through visions and dreams. Jesus appeared to these people in visions and dreams, like, because there's nobody there to teach them, you know, nobody. laborers going out there so yeah. jesus is appearing to people and saying i am the truth i am the way i am the life you know and so these people have this like almost like uh, paul or saul type conversion you know like okay yes lord what do you yeah. want me to do <laughs> and so they have this encounter but there's nothing there to teach them and to and to solidify it and to get them to that point where they are you know reproducing it if that makes sense they're not being taught you know, so you have all these believers that are just on fire. You know, they want, they love God, they love Jesus, they want to spread it, but they don't know how. Yeah. You know, so they're a wildfire out there with. And so fast forward now to, you know, we get involved and we say we're coming. And then a few weeks later, we get asked, hey, do you guys want to, you know, help with the youth? And we're like, okay, sure, why not, right? And then... And so, um, you know, we were just going to help, you know, like, whatever we needed to do to help with the, the youth. No plans of teaching. You know, on being led by the Holy Spirit and knowing the voice of God. And um, the other person we're working with was like, do any of you have, you know, a message you want to share? You want to teach, you know? And I was like, 
actually, <laughs> you know, which is very out of character for me in that kind of a setting. I'm normally like a just, you know, kind of sit back. Um, but I was like, actually, like, I've had this message on my heart, you know, since we said we were coming. Um, and I didn't know how it was going to happen. Reaching on. As we're talking to people, we're finding out these, te- you know, these young people and um, these youth came to, you know, came to Jesus through a vision or whatever, and they're feeling like God doesn't love them because he's not appearing to them like he did when they got saved. And it just hit me how much God loves them, you know, that he. The answer, the very thing that they had questions about, you know, like, does God even love me because I don't hear his voice? I don't hear, meaning I don't hear an audible voice like I used to. And then here I teach the ways God's. And through the leading of his Holy Spirit, it's very rare that you see a vision or hear an audible voice. Those things can happen. But that's not the norm for the believer. We're guided by that vo- that inward witness. And it just, it blessed me, you know, that God was speaking to me. It was like, okay, yes. <laughs> you know, that he was speaking to me and preparing months before for the very thing that was the answer for those young people. And through that, we had some young people that got filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, we had young, a young person that got delivered from a demon, from oppression, (laughs) you know, that just all came out of that service, and, you know, just amazing things, and um, um, in the first service, where we weren't even ministering, we were just there to help, there was a call for healing to come forth for um, people that had a, like, a lump or growth on their throat or on their neck, Um, And a lot of women came forward. Lay hands on them. And then I got pulled up to lay hands on people. And um, I've felt this before, but never this strong. Years ago, Cindy Duvall, you know, she laid hands on me and passed on an anointing. She said she was passing on an anointing from Dad Hagen where there was the healing anointing in my hands. And there's been times I've felt that, but we were over there, and I laid hands on the first person, and my hand was on fire. You know, it was like a coal was in my hand, and it was just like there was such a hunger, and it pulled things out that had been laid, those deposits that had been laid, waiting for the opportune moment. So, you know, never doubt God's preparing you all along the way. He's putting things in you um, that he's going to pull out in the right time. And, you know, there I was just, we were just there just to help. But then God was using opportunities to teach us even more things about flowing with his spirit and being present and being available and being there when things call. All of the Americans that were there were all Rama grads or a connection to Rama. And like all of us, for whatever reason, we just knew like, you know, hey, we talk to whoever's in charge and say, hey, whatever you need, just let us know. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, one of the directors of, of one of the schools went up to him and he said, hey, if you need, I, I see you're short on ushers, let me usher for you. I mean, it's just the heart, you know, the, yeah. the servant's heart and just, just being there to help. But every person who was there who was part of Rama, did something like that. Um, and so, again, that just shows the heart of Rama, shows the heart yeah. of the tra- and the, and the training, the, the mm-hmm. things that we learned while we were there about being a blessing, about being a help. Just sit there and, and, and receive, you know, what they need. And so it was just a, a real blessing to see that yeah. um, as well. And even the things since Rama that we've, you know, being here and serving and, you know, serving in maybe background situations. But that's what we were doing over there at many times, you know, because we knew we're there to help. We're there to, and what was really amazing and 
um, would just bring tears to our eyes every time they would say it, but the people who have done this conference, um, they said that this was the easiest conference they have ever had because of the supply that Rama brought and that partnership that was there. Not only was it the easiest, it was the largest they've ever had in the history of doing this. Of Muslim nations mm -hmm. there, receiving this teaching, receiving these impartations, receiving all this, you know, and, and they're taking it back to those areas. Where they risk their life for the gospel. It's a, it really was, it was amazing. Um, but, you know, kind of going back to what I was saying before with these, with the pastors, you know, they felt like they're alone, they're, like they're on an island. Well, this, this family is feeling the same thing. Um, mm -hmm. They've been in Turkey for 30 years, mm -hmm. and they went, you know, from Rama there. And Graduated right after my dad. Yeah, right around yeah. that time. Yeah. There's something in the water in the 80s in, in Rama. Because <laughs> this person was... <laughs> Like pastor, we're like, <laughs> I mean, they were like, like he's the same like person. My dad, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and we like hung <laughs> out with uh, one of his children, yep. and as they shared stories, we're like, "This is my dad." <laughs> yeah. like, Bless God, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna do <laughs> yeah. it this way. <laughs> so it was just you know that was just funny, but um, but they felt like they were, you know they've been alone for so long, and you know like on the like and that's. They, they get lonely, um, especially in places like this where you don't have a community of believers. You don't have a community of people really supporting you. You kind of get there, and you get so wrapped up in what you're doing that you kind of lose your connections, if that makes sense. There, there are even camps in the United States for burned-out missionaries because burnout is such a big issue because they go there and they have to be all things to all people. You know, um, one of the people we talked with, um, she went in one location and she was, she was mom. She never got rest. You know, she didn't learn how to, it was later she learned how to, okay, I've got to learn how to say no and to rest or I'm going to burn out. And that's a common thing because, you know, they don't have the things we take for granted here, yeah. the communities that we have where we can go to, you know, RMAI meetings or we can go to, you know, Southwest Believers Conference or we can go to camp meeting, all those things that are just so readily available here yeah. that they don't have. But, you know, and kind of going back to that too, you know, we talked about at the beginning, you know, how, how little money makes it there, right? That's a, that's a stress, I mean, you guys know finances are stress, right? And you're trying to figure out how they're going to pay the next month's bills or keep everything going afloat. Because and because, oh, sorry, I'm going to go ahead. <laughs> and, um, and so somebody, one of my friends, I was talking to him about, you know, the whole trip and everything. And he says, why do you think so little money goes there? And I said, I think, honestly, it's because you don't see what's going on there because you can't post it. I mean, you, you cannot, can't. Yeah. you can't post all the awesome things that are happening because people's lives are literally in danger. You post their picture or you post anything about them. In this area, you're not going to see things like you saw in Africa with Reinhard Bonnke. You're not going to see these mass crusades where thousands of people are getting saved or Billy Graham conference, whatever it is. You're not going to see that because it's not possible to do right now. And so what they're doing is like it may, I guess we kind of, we want to put our money where we know it's doing good, right? Mm -hmm. And so if we don't see these things happening over there, do we really want to send our money over there? Kind of makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. But the way they have to do ministry, the, the way they have to do evangelism is not the way we think it needs to be done. They have to build relationships. And building relationships takes so much time, especially in a place where they don't trust you. Where America has a bad reputation, right?
be intentional about how you do things, but it's also build, building trust. So one of the ministers there, um, her ministry, they meet people's needs first, physical needs, groceries, medical, um, bills. medical bills, surgeries, whatever it is. That's what their ministry does. And through that relationship, sh through showing the love of Jesus and the love of the church, that's how they get people in. Because then they're like, well, so this other group's not doing that. <laughs> you know, and they're, they start to reevaluate and rethink their belief system. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's like that first layer level. And then they begin to do training, leadership. And they start s sowing those seeds into them. And then having them over for lunch, you know, or meals, which is how they do church. Because, you know, like here, we have the freedom to come to this beautiful, you know, property and building. There, they've got to be a little more covert about how they go into a gathering. Because they start seeing people coming to a place every week at the same time. Mm -hmm. Questions start being asked, right? Yeah. But also, too, what we didn't realize is that um, in, in Turkey, we know this, but on their IDs, like their government IDs, their religion is listed. License. Their, their religion is listed on their ID. Yeah. So if it says anything other than the majority religion. They can't get jobs. They'll be discriminated because of that. Yeah. Or they may not be able to get loans. Or, I mean, it's like, yeah. a, I want to say a death sentence, but like a social death sentence, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, again, even though you may have people who love Jesus, love, I mean, if they do that, they're, it's just a totally different world. Yeah. It's so hard to, like, really, yeah. Yeah, there we go. So, like, we were talking about just the hunger, and when they gave the call in the adult service for um, people to be filled with the Holy Spirit, pretty much other than the pastors and the Rama leaders that were there, the whole room came forward. And got filled. And it was just really awesome to watch that happen. Just the hunger for the things of God. The hunger for being filled with the Holy Spirit. And, um, you know, and all of us just jumping in where we were needed and that kind of stuff. It was just really, you just couldn't help but cry at times. Like, we would just be talking in the hotel room crying, you know, about just what was happening and everything. And what was is actually pictures of um, youth ministry. So that's, you know, just some snapshots of our week there. Um, prophetic words given to some of these, you know, young people and just things that came out and, um, you know, getting to minister to them, but also have fun, and, you know, that kind of thing. They love the candy that we brought so thank you for those that gave American candy. They loved it. And we had like a big little party at the, the last session with glow sticks and um, candy. And the message was on, you are the light in the darkness. We turned all the lights off and then we had glow sticks going on, you know, <laughs> to tell them that's you in this world and in your, your country and in your land and so forth. Um, but something that really just touched our hearts, you see our um, interpreter there. But Isaac's heart, he was Mr. Anything You Needed. You need me to be a translator? I'll be a translator. You need me to uh, be your tech guy? I'll be your tech guy. Lead you, need, worship. you need me to lead worship? <laughs> I'll lead worship. Yeah. You need me to, you know, anything you needed. He was right there, mm -hmm. just happy to serve, yeah. ready. I mean, he was there. If you needed something, you turn, and there's Isaac, you know. <laughs> so he just, we just fell in love with that, that guy and um, his heart. And we're like, there needs to be more guys like that, you know, in church. He is under a good pastor. Yeah. Um, he's under the pastor who put on the conference. So he's got this teaching. He's, 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 he understands his role. He understands what he's supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And he's fulfilling it. Yeah. And again, as we talked about.
to be like Isaac. Isaac. <laughs> so that Isaac doesn't have to do everything. Isaac can do what he's called to do, and mm -hmm. other people are there to bring up the slack. Yeah. And so that's, again, and if you don't have an Isaac in your church there, pastor and the family, they're everything. Yeah. They're wearing all the hats. And again, yeah. that takes a toll, you know, on, on these ministers and all that. So um, the work that's, that's going to happen, the, the things that, that Rhema's going to do and that we're going to do with these people is going to be something amazing. Yeah. And we're not going to see the fruit of it for a little while. But when we do, it's going to be miraculous in a lot of ways. I mean, just absolutely incredible. Um, so this is kind of where we get into our message, our <laughs> I guess you can message. say. <laughs> uh, There was so much, oh, in the next slide, we'll just share, this is just a, as many people as could fit in a photo. Those are the lives that were touched, you know, by you sending us. Mm -hmm. So we just want to say, you know, thank you for those who gave and prayed and helped. Or brought candy um, or whatever it was. Candy. I mean. We've been asked to come back, so we're looking at 2023, and there's several open doors. get into that in a little bit but I want us to go to Matthew 24 um, 14 and <clears throat> we're gonna go back a little bit to that story I was sharing um, January 10 years ago sitting in a class at Rama. Matt Beamer comes in as the guest speaker and he preaches on this verse and um, it says, and this good news of the kingdom, the gospel, will be preached throughout the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. And then the end ready for Jesus to come back. I'm just ready. I'm ready to go to heaven, not have to deal with this stupid world anymore, blah, 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 blah. I'm ready for Jesus to come back. It's getting dark and da, 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 da. And, of course, that was also talk was starting to happen that the end of the world was going to be 12, 12, 12. Do you guys remember that? I mean, there's been so many end of the worlds predicted. Um, so this was January of 2012. And he shares this scripture. And something. No, I'm not ready for Jesus to come back. Like, I'm just now here at Rhema, having even started my missions classes, and there's a whole world out there that hasn't heard the gospel. You know, it is not time. Like, how selfish of you, <laughs> you know? And then he preaches on this message, and it gave me such hope and peace because he talked about, you know, it says, to all nations, and then the end will come. If you go and study that out in the Greek, all nations means ethnos. It means people groups. And you remember those statistics we showed at the beginning? He used those same statistics. And there are, I don't know if you saw that map, but there's a lot of people groups that haven't had the gospel preached to them. And so all that to say... You know, there's 3.5 billion people that don't have access to the gospel, that have not heard the name of Jesus, you know, the name by which all men should be saved. They haven't even heard the name of Jesus. Jesus himself is having to appear to people because there's a lack of laborers. And so there's a work to be done. And Jesus is not coming back until that work is done. And so, and so while we may be caught up with how dark things may be here in the United States and how culturally dark things are, I, I would, you know, say we need to shift our focus to pray for laborers to go into the harvest, you know, and to gather the harvest for that last great revival that will take place um so yeah if you remember in in genesis abraham right um sodom and gomorrah what did abraham do to try to save them there be 
50 righteous. <laughs> Yeah, I think you got down to 10. I think you got down to 10. If there be 10 righteous people in this city, will you spare it? And God said yes, but he didn't go any further than that, right? So Because he, he thought, to, I mean, there's got to be 10, right? you know? <laughs> there's got to be 10 people that love God. <laughs> but the point is, is that Abraham was there to stand in the gap, right? To intercede for these people so they would not see the judgment of God. This is our job as the church. We're to be standing in the middle between the judgment of God and these unreached people. And be interceding for, you know, that delaying the coming of Christ so we can get the gospel out there. Mm -hmm. You know, we're to be salt and light. And if you look, you know, think about what salt is. Salt's a preserver. You know, salt preserves. And so our heart should be to be, you know, praying like Jesus, just like God, just give us more time. Like, you know, we're not ready for that. You know, we're not ready for that judgment yet. We've got to reach these people and we've got to reach these people, you know. And so I would just encourage you. Like, I, I just, I feel like from when I see in the word and when I look at for, you know, laborers to go into those harvests, to gather the f precious fruit of the earth for the end gathering, you know, for those people to be touched with the truth that God loves them. God's on their side. God's for them. He's not against them. And so, you know, we talk about the Great Commission all the time, right? And the pastor's been talking about it like a lot lately. I don't know if you guys noticed that or not, but. Yeah. And then in Mark 16, what does it say? <laughs> what are we supposed to do? Go ye in the all the world, right? Yep. Preaching the gospel. So I'm going to read it. Go ahead. All right. So go into the world and preach and publish openly the good news, the gospel, to every creature of the whole human race. He who believes, who adheres to and trusts in and relies on the gospel and him whom it, it, it sets forth and is baptized will be saved from the penalty of eternal death. The gospel will be condemned. And these attesting signs will accompany the pastors, the apostles, the prophets. No, no. These attesting signs will follow those who believe. I don't know about you, but I'm a who believe, you know, those who believe. They will pick up serpents. Oh, sorry, I jumped ahead. <laughs> um, will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new languages. They will pick up serpents. And even if they, eat, even if they drink anything deadly, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will get well. So you are of them that believe. Right. You are supposed to have these attesting signs, wonders, and miracles following you wherever you go. Um, so you should be walking in the fullness of his power. Before we get that, sorry. Oh, okay. All right, so remember we <laughs> talked about before, right, uh, about how evangelism happens in the Middle East, okay? It's not through arguments. It's not through me explaining why Christianity is better than Islam, why Allah is not who he is, or why Muhammad's not through who, who he is. They have a religion, they have an established religion. Follow to the T or they perish, right? Me going in there and trying to intellectually, soulishly tell them why this is wrong is not going to save them. What's going to save them is if their child is dying from a sickness and I lay my hands on them and the power of God comes through me and heals that child, they know that Jesus loves them. Mm -hmm. They know that God is real. Because it's not going to happen anywhere else. Yeah. In every other religion in the world, God is dead. Right? We're the only religion where our God died. But guess what? He lives now. He was resurrected. His power is still on this earth. He wants to heal Deliver. Deliver. All that. He wants to do these things. 
But who does he do it through? Not us. All of us. Uh These signs shall follow. Uh Who? Them that that believe, right? That's our job, Uh right? Now, we're not saying that, you know, Expedition Church, all of you guys, we got to go to the Middle East right now and go lay hands (laughs) on the sick. Okay? We're not saying that. (laughs) Because if you are not called, you do not want to go. (laughs) Trust me. (laughs) All right? (laughs) That's not what we're saying, okay? We're saying that your job may not be to go there. Yeah. It may not be to physically step foot in this area, lay hands on the sick, start a church, evangelize, whatever it is. That may not be your your job, and that's fine Mm -hmm. because we need people here, right? Yeah. But your job is to support, to pray, to, to help those people go who need to go, right? Yeah. But also, here, Pleasant Garden, Greensboro, this is your mission field. Amen. People here still need to know the love of God yes. and what he wants to do for yeah. them. Yes. It's not going to take Facebook arguments. It's not going to take Twitter battles. It's not going to take these things trying to say that you know, we're better wants to touch them in an intimate way to have a relationship with them and to help them out when they come he doesn't leave us right we don't convert we don't say you know we love Jesus and that's it he doesn't just leave us alone after that it's a continuing relationship fills us with the Holy Spirit with power to go out and do these things right Mm -hmm. that's how much he loves us but it's also how much he loves other people. Because what he's put inside of you is not supposed to stay there. It's not just for you. Mm-hmm. It's not just for you to sit back and wait for the coming of Jesus. It's to take it to mm-hmm. So I just encourage you guys to really, really think about it. And to know that that life inside of you is not meant to stay there. If that life stays inside of you and doesn't come out, what happens to it? It comes stagnant. It comes stagnant. Y'all ever heard of the Dead Sea? Why is it the Dead Sea? Because it has an inlet, but it doesn't have an outlet. So everything gets in there, and it festers, and stagnates, and it dies. But the Sea of Galilee, is it the Galilee, the other one? Oh. Anyways, <laughs> seas with life have an outlet. There's things always going in and always coming out, and that's what we're supposed to be, oh, the outlet. <laughs> yeah, amen. Um, and if you ever fan the fear of people, there's tons of scriptures about, we won't get into all of those because we are running short on time, but praying for boldness, that with all boldness, you know, I will declare the works of the Lord. Um, you know, so there's tons of scriptures to stand on, to pray for boldness, to pray for courage, and, um, you know, for your words to be filled with power and boldness when you do talk to people, when you do minister to people, and you speak to people. Because we don't want our words, you know, that are just our intellectual words. We want words that are life-giving. We want words of life that flow out of us in every situation, in everyone we come in contact with. Um, I was listening, this week has been... Next Sunday, um, his opening message to the student body on Monday of this past week, I was on my lunch break listening to it, and I was getting so stirred up. I messaged him. I was like, that was a great message for the students and alumni, (laughs) you know, (laughs) because it just stirred me up. But um, just a synopsis of something he said Signs, wonders, and miracles. They are for you to do God to do as God works through his people. We have no right to take a powerless God life of God by which his life is going to flow. I don't care what your past was, there is not one thing in it that disqualifies you from being a reservoir, partaker, and a qu- conduit of the life of God. 
And I just want to encourage you with that. You are a conduit. You have the power of God flowing out of you. You have wells in you that spring forth with rivers of living life to your touch that's going on. Um, You have that life coming out of you and flowing out of you. And anything else on that line? No, we, okay. Still, with the stream. With the what? With the stream. Oh, oh, okay. So we're going to end the stream. So thank you for joining us <laughs> at Expedition Church, and we'll see you.